Hey, what's up everybody? The audio hopefully is all right. I'm across the room. You just have to deal with it. So I'm here experimenting um, with uh, charging this coil like a cap and then discharging it across itself. And my wife is in the background doing stuff. <laughs> so just ignore her. She's having a, a work day out here with me. So um, currently I have this configured um, very similarly to what I showed you in the last video or in the search for answers number 20. Um, I'm using a relay bank. I'm using a battery. I will throw the schematic on the screen for you. The reason I'm using this battery is because I need to run the relays. And the reason I need the relays is because I need a way to break and make this circuit that has a big gap. So by using many relays in series, each one having one millimeter, if I use 20 of them, then I have 20 millimeters of distance in total distance between um, the coil and the short. Now the interesting thing here is that um, I am using this battery but it is isolated electrically from this coil and the circuit. So this battery is doing nothing. There's no batteries connected to this at all except for to run the relays and I'm using a reed switch and some magnets up here to run the relay. Oh wait a minute. So I was in the middle of filming this video and I charged the internal capaci uh, capacitance of this coil so high, I shorted it out. So the demonstration you're about to watch is the only remnants of video of I, that I have of this thing doing what I just uh, am about to show you. So keep that in mind. Have a look. All right, just to uh, quickly take a look here, I've got a reed relay right there and uh, a magnet on here right now. I've just got the, the single one, but basically it just triggers it like that. And the relay bank as per normal. This time I'm using all of them in series, uh, all the contacts in series to give me the biggest um, distance there. Um, the diode that I had on there is a microwave oven diode. I disconnected it right now. So yeah, that's kind of just a bit of a close-up for you, so you can kind of see what's going on. Run the relay. You can see it's still got some, some uh, charge left in it. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to spin this guy up, and I'm going to let it run on its own. So there's no power connected to this thing. To prove that to you, I can basically get to a point where it does not move at all. So I'm going to run it by hand and that'll build up the charge, okay? I'm not above the self-resonant frequency. I'd like to be. I think it would work pretty interestingly above that frequency, but we're at the frequency that we're at. The oscilloscope, the only thing I'm using is a current probe so that I can just see the relays. The relays are being switched on and off, and I can only get up to a certain uh, RPM, and once I get to that RPM, uh, the relays won't even switch fast enough, so that's why it slows back down. Um, again, I'm doing the relays to, to make and break basically a big gap over many relays. So I need to figure out a better solution mechanically for that, but I don't want any friction. Um, so this is pretty well frictionless. Look at that, charge back up. Okay, here we go. Watch how long it runs. Let's do it again. It kind of moved on me there. It's not. It's not secured. I really want to get it going. I'm going faster than the relays can even switch right now. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? I still got a little left. I get it over, gotta get it over the hump. It's not balanced. This thing looks like it's gonna try to fall off. Let's put it back on. There we go. Maybe that's why it was wobbly. So we're charging up the, uh, the coil itself, the capacitance of the coil, and then we're discharging it across itself. And look at it run.
pretty interesting thing. The only thing I've got connected here is the magnet and then a switch, mechanical switch. Um, if I connect the outside coil, then I'm shorting this across the outside coil. The outside coil will make a magnetic field. And uh, as long as it's in the same polarity, it will actually aid in the rotation. I don't have the probes connected to this thing because it actually messes things up. Oh, look at that. I think it's actually the wrong way. We'll flip these leads so that the, the current flowing through the outside coil is in the proper direction. Let's, let's try that again. Nope, I think it's still in the wrong direction. Yeah, that or we got something screwed up. That might be. I think it moved on me. The rotor is not real secure, so it does move. Kind of bounces around. Oh, there, see it moved on me. All right, welcome back. So, uh, unfortunately, um, although I did succeed in showing you what I wanted to show you, I've been playing around with this for some time, and uh, in that moment in time, I was really charging it up uh, probably past 6,000 volts internally. Uh, and when it's running at a high RPM, what happens is the coil, uh, or I mean the relays and the reed switch, they don't actually have time to make, so it has to slow back down before the relays can actually make. And the charge in the coil is so high that whenever the coil makes and it keeps rotating, eventually it doesn't have enough uh, inertia in the uh, flywheel here to get it around to the next cycle. <clears throat> However, when you advance it, you can see it did still have charge left in the coil. I could run it about three or four more time uh, revolutions there and it would actually run. And then eventually it would, basically the charge would be no longer in the coil and you couldn't run it anymore. So um, this was just a demonstration to kind of give you an idea that if you can, um, you know, get the counter EMF to not show up in the coil by charging it like a capacitor and the currents and the geometry being correct to where the currents don't produce a magnetic field in a orientation that is opposing your magnet spinning. <clears throat> For instance, if the dielectric field is being charged depending on how things are configured, um, the charge and um, the current flowing to build that charge is at a 90 degree angle from the magnet, and therefore if there is a magnetic field from the currents moving to charge the dielectric field, um, then actually you don't really get any opposing magnetic field that impedes your rotating magnet. And that's the difference. Um, so there is probably still a small magnetic field there, it's just at a 90 degree orientation. And uh, if you play around with coils and magnets enough, you'll realize that you can achieve that goal. So, unfortunately, uh, this coil is shorted out. Now, where the coil is shorted out <clears throat> is in between the two windings where I was using it as a capacitor. And you can still connect it in a long series run. And I only lost about one, uh, or maybe like a, about 500 ohms out of the 50,000 ohm resistance of this coil. So I can still use this coil as the conventional configuration and I can test it with uh, high frequency switching and I, I can still do those other tests. I just can't charge this one like a capacitor. Now, honestly, this was only an example because it's not by filer wound and the capacitance is very small. So if you had a, if you had this amount of wire and you had it by filer, you wouldn't need to charge it to those extreme voltages in order to achieve the amount of uh, stored energy in that um, capacitive uh, sense of this type of configuration. And so, <clears throat> realistically, I wouldn't need to go that high in the voltage and I could achieve a pretty decent amount of charge. And yeah, you can do some interesting things. Now, um, it is to my opinion right now that you still have to overcome frictional losses in your system. So. Uh, that's something to keep in mind. You're not going to be able to just spin this thing up and run it the rest of uh, of its time. I don't know. I'm not saying you can't. I'm saying maybe you can. However, you still have to overcome frictional losses. 
So the bearings and stuff, I mean, this guy spins really free, but um, but the point is, is that uh, you just got to remember that. So anyway, this video, uh, unfortunately, I didn't get to demo a lot of that to you, but you could totally see in the video if you watch the RPM, as it slows back down, it is, it is actually holding itself at a constant RPM for a few, you know, I don't know, 10 revolutions or something, and then it doesn't have enough to get over the hub. So it's just an interesting reminder that um, you can use a coil uh, completely different than you conventionally do, and you can do unconventional things with it, which in this case, there was no batteries connected to the coil and the shorting mechanism is just to run the relays. And through rotating this without any cogging, I could produce rotation of its own. Um, so yes, I had to charge it up first in a sense, and then it would discharge over time. But I did that without the reaction, basically without the re reaction of Lenz's law. Um, there's still an equal and opposite reaction. The, the equal and opposite reaction is not showing up as a magnetic field, it's showing up as a charge uh, stored in the dielectric field. And that's the difference. So anyway, uh, just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind, uh, in order to generate a magnetic field, okay, you have to have current flowing. And if you have to have current flowing, you usually have to expend energy to keep that current flowing. Um, and you have to use, you know, you have to, well, you have to keep it, you have to keep the current flowing to keep the field. However, in a dielectric field, once you charge it up, the dielectric field is, like, there at all times, which is something interesting. You don't have to have a closed circuit to keep a dielectric field a field. So that's the difference between the two, and that's the interesting part about it. So there's your two hand-in-hands. Okay, well, unfortunately, since I can't do that anymore, I gotta try to do something else. Um, but this was a wonderful experiment and good test to demonstrate the principle and the application of charging a dielectric field with a magnetic field without impeding the rotation of the magnet. And through geometry, you can achieve much better results. I'm pretty sure of that. But this is what I got right now, so this is what we'll deal with. All right, peace and love, God bless. Watch the Bible more, read the Bible more, however you want to do it. Um, that's all I got for you. Thanks for watching. We'll see you another day. Bye-bye. Something else I uh, thought was real interesting is if you watch that magnet over there, when I move this one, it'll actually move that one. So you can imagine the, uh, the size of the magnetic field that just the permanent magnets are making. I can't even imagine how far the... Uh, electromagnetic field is actually moving this this stuff around here it's pretty wild I mean that's uh, well, what is that you can see it here it's a good uh, I don't know eight maybe six five maybe five foot away still pretty far